Think about your bank account. You remove the debt and multiply your investments. That's yeah. what fermentation does. So you take cabbage, good. Sauerkraut, which is fermented cabbage, amazing. Milk, some can be good. Fermented dairy, kefir, much better. The list goes on and on. So fermentation unlocks the good in something and it can reduce the bad. Hey everybody, Dr. Josh Axe here. Welcome to the show. This week I have one of my favorite guests because he's one of my best friends. It's Jordan Rubin. Jordan Rubin is the New York Times best-selling author of The Maker's Diet. He has authored over 30 books. Millions are in print. And today we're going to be talking about the power of organic food. What we're going to talk about is organic important or not. We're going to talk about regenerative agriculture and how you can help heal the planet. We're also going to get into all kinds of things, ancient superfoods, how to heal your body, and lots of other things. But Jordan, hey, welcome to my house and, and the program. Good to be here. All right, well, so we're going to talk about, uh, again, organic, regenerative agriculture, fermentation, sprouting, all of these terms that you may or may not know what they mean, but they're really important when it comes to our health and the health of our family. And I know you have a really powerful story. I mean, you, you know, overcame ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, numerous illnesses, and used food as medicine, used your mindset as medicine in order to heal yourself. So I want to get into that. But let me ask you this, you know, some of the things we're going to talk about, um, specifically regenerative agriculture. So again, people have heard your story about how you healed yourself. Not a lot of people know exactly what inspired you to essentially become a farmer and get into the regenerative agriculture space. It was actually the story you alluded to. So when I was ill, I traveled the world. I went to 69 medical experts. I tried conventional medicine, it failed. Tried natural medicine, went around the world, multiple countries, tried every gadget, gizmo, lotion, and potion you can think of. And I was ultimately healed through what I would call a biblical, holistic diet and wellness plan. But in order to consume this, I'll say real food, biblically correct, scientifically proven diet, I needed foods that were not widely available. In fact, some of them are not legal in every single state. I'm talking about raw grass-fed dairy products. I'm talking about raw juices. Like back in the day, I yeah. could get raw carrot juice from the health food store and now you can't anymore. So I made a commitment, and this is funny because I was 21 years old. I had no money. I was living in a motor home down by the ocean, not down by the river, but <laughs> close enough. And I knew that if I was going to live and eat this way, I needed to have a hand in growing and raising my own food. And so I made a commitment in 1996 that one day I would grow and raise some of the world's healthiest foods for me, my family, and to share with others. I didn't know what I would do with my life other than share the message of healing that I received, but it was always a dream of mine and it didn't really happen until 2009 when I purchased the first piece of farmland and essentially started diving into this message that I think is so biblical. I mean, if you read the Bible, I think 20% of the references have to do with agriculture. Yeah. And I knew nothing. I never grew a thing. I didn't have a green thumb, a green pinky. I mean, I, I was a suburban kid through and through. I learned the power of food. You mentioned fermentation and power of beverages and traditional nutrients but I didn't know how to create the food. Mm. And once I learned about what is now called regenerative agriculture, it kind of changed my worldview. And so I have a passion to see the world fed and the planet healed and people healed, of course, too. Yeah, so Jordan, I know one of the things too, when I first met you, and I love sharing the story. So when I first met Jordan, I went down to stay with him in West Palm Beach, Florida. I walked in the house and Jordan for lunch was having uh, raw salmon ceviche, which essentially it's salmon that's soaked in like lemon juice with some things. And then he was drinking raw veggie juice. And that was what he ate, you know, a good part of the, the, the weekend. And I was thinking, man, this guy is really, you know, hardcore. And, he, and he, he was very, very healthy. But walk us through, just I want, I want to hear both of your diets. So when you followed that maker's diet, when you overcame and beat Crohn's colitis, what did your day, like, like what did your meals look like for breakfast, lunch, dinner, or what, what were you eating at that time that helped you heal? If I remember correctly, and it was interesting because a lot of the time when I was getting well, I lived in a motor home and I didn't have a refrigerator. So I would literally get a cooler with ice. It was like 1968 Chevrolet bunkhouse motor home. And so I would have to fill it with ice 
every other day. It was in San Diego. So I would go to a health food store. In fact, one of those that I shopped at was called Boney's, which later became Henry's, which is now Sprouts. And I would get there and I have to get there first because they had only so much raw kefir and raw cream and they had raw carrot juice. And I would get, I would cook in my motorhome. I'd have grass fed beef and I had Kamut bread. Everything was the best quality I could get. So I would do some raw carrot juice and cream, raw green juice. I ate wild fish. I ate just real foods, probiotic rich dairy. And I literally had to find my food every other day. It was almost like manna where I couldn't store it up. And what was interesting, and this is why I have such a connection to some of these health food stores, I knew that I wasn't allowed to park in the parking lot at Boney's, which is now Sprouts. It still exists today. But I also knew that I couldn't afford anyone else to get my kefir. So I literally spent the night in the parking lot of what is now a Sprouts store in um, Mission Beach. And what's funny, the Lord has a real great sense of humor, but 10 years later, I was giving a seminar at the store where I spent the night 10 years earlier, hoping just to secure some food and some you know, juice to, to see me get well. So really think about every food category, the best quality. If it was a grain, it was going to be sourdough. I had the sourdough Kamut, which was more nutrient dense and less gluten than regular wheat. Yeah. And it was a pretty simple diet because I only had my motor home and no refrigerator. So it was a lot of that. And I got the carrot juice, a little bit of cream idea from Europe where they would, they knew somehow that fat soluble vitamins were more absorbable in the carrot juice when you mixed it with cream. And obviously green juice was super amazing. I would do Kamut grass juice, parsley, celery, et cetera. And I not only gained 29 pounds in 40 days, but the inflammation went down. And now granted, I did other great things, deep breathing. I walked on the beach every day. Mm. I really went through an emotional healing process where I would think back about a lot of my life. And I knew I was in this unique period where I had nothing going other than me getting well, medically withdraw from school. I was a dropout, if you will. But I relived kind of my life, made peace with where I was and was just anxious for God to use me. And when I was ill, I always said that whatever helps me get well, I'm going to share it with the world. Now, I did all these treatments and went to clinics. So I I thought I'd be recommending a clinic in Germany if that helped. But the fact that God healed me with a diet that was very biblical made it even easier. It It was all his, not mine. So my book wasn't Jordan's diet. It was the maker's diet, which was a a real blessing. And I still meet people today that have read and been blessed by the book. In fact, a friend of yours, Dr. Will Cole, who's become a very successful practitioner and messenger, I read a snippet where I read Jordan's book, The Maker's Diet, when I was a teenager. And I'm just like, how did I become a sage? I thought I was like (laughs) relevant and cool. Uh, uh, My, My kids remind me that I'm not. But anyway, so that's the story. It was really simple. And two years of illness where I never was better one day, I mean, I literally, no one likes to talk about this, but I had between 12 and 30 bloody bowel movements a day. Wow. And it, when you're, when you have Crohn's disease as a teenager, it's embarrassing. Like yeah. you don't want to tell any, it's not like you broke your elbow or, you know, it, it's, I mean, I was in the bathroom all the time. I slept for 45 minutes max at one time. I described myself as being trapped in a prison that was my own body. I was wow. 104 pounds at my lowest and I'm a little over six feet tall. So it was brutal. And I I hardly remember the feeling. I have to almost remind myself to be grateful where I've come from. But I've been blessed to see so many people overcome disease as a result. So in a way, you know, if the Lord wanted me to be sort of a a messenger from my mess, then that's that's what he has for me. Really, everything I have today is a result of my testimony. So Yeah, I love it, Jordan. I mean, one of the things I can just share with everybody that happens all the time when Jordan and I are together is people are always coming up to Jordan uh, saying, hey, I read your book, literally, I, I, I've been healed from ulcerative colitis or autoimmune disease or numerous conditions. And so Jordan, I know that you've been just an incredible uh, person to really share your healing testimony, but then this strategy, and one of the things you'll notice 
is that anytime anybody heals from anything significant as Jordan's sharing, there tends to be more of a protocol. I mean, Jordan, I know one thing is, you know, they, they were praying every single day, really working on spiritual health. Uh, he was really, you know, he mentioned emotions, setting himself free from any negative emotions and fostering those positive emotions. He was walking on the beach, doing that grounding, sunbathing. And then also, you know, as we talked about him using food as medicine, you'll hear just a few key themes here, raw fermented probiotic rich foods like fermented dairy products. I know now he does some fermented coconut products, that sort of thing. So getting those probiotics, the green juices, the carrot juices, the vegetables and wild organic meat like like wild organic, uh, you know, sockeye salmon. That was the basis of his diet, which obviously did a lot of things. But I know for you and I both, Jordan, like we started growing this passion, you even more so than me, for regenerative agriculture. And what, number one, we wanna see people healed, but we also wanna see the planet healed. So I'd love to go through, and I'd love to hear you talk about really regenerative agriculture. Number one, what is it? Why it's important? and how it impacts both the planet, but also our own health. Absolutely, well the term regenerative, and I love it, we use it all the time, but it's basically bringing something back to its creation, right? Because mm. Genesis is the creation. If you regenerate, then you are bringing something back to how it was, and wow. I'm saying this with, with all due respect, and I know how it sounds, but regenerative agriculture is bringing the earth back to the garden. I mean, that, that really is, is what we're talking about, and because I didn't understand agriculture, I didn't know the difference between a perennial plant and an annual plant, just for the listeners. Yep. A perennial plant is something you plant once and it produces fruit and grows every single year. Think of a blueberry bush or a peach tree. Those are perennials. Perennials grow deep roots. Their leaves fall if you live in an environment where there's seasons. The leaves compost and build nutrient-dense soil. When it's a drought, the deep roots bring water into the plant and they're not struggling. And, and every year, a perennial plant produces more fruit and it takes less work to tend it. Wow. An annual, think of kale, carrots, celery, cucumber, tomato, you have to plant it each year. So you plant a seed or you can plant a start or a sprouted cutting, whatever you wanna say and it dies and you have to start over. And when you plant annuals, a lot of times you dig up the ground and when people talk about carbon, you release carbon and you destroy your soil microbiome when you do that. So mm. I'm a believer in kale and I'm a believer in carrots. I told you I drank carrot juice, celery juice, parsley, but the planet's crust is its skin. Its topsoil is its microbiome. So if you constantly disturb that, you're going to have less healthy plants and you're going to need to feed the soil. And it's it's not regenerative. It may be slightly sustainable, but it's arguable. So for me, the best diet and therefore the best way of farming is regenerative agriculture where you give more than you take, right? So we all, a lot of us talk about America printing money and being the only nation where we're consumers and not producers. Like we can take whatever we want and farm less and less and make money out of thin air and bring food in. That's not sustainable. Yep. Regenerative agriculture means that today I have five inches of topsoil. A year from today, I have six. Yep. So you're actually regenerating the soil. And I will argue, and it's funny coming from me that our topsoil is our heritage, it's everything. Topsoil helps us absorb water into the ground, which makes water healthier to drink. It helps and is required for all agriculture. If we lose our topsoil, which we're losing trillions of tons every year, it's getting washed into the waterways, we lose everything. So somebody said that there's 60 years of farming left if we don't change the way we farm. Wow. And I know we, you and I can look, I'll be 105, almost 106 in 60 years, but. That's, that's it's not okay. I wanna yep. leave the world in a much better place than when I came in. And I know that's cliche, but we can do it and everybody can do it. Whether you're in, you know, overseas in a place where you have a potted plant on your sort of apartment, you know, window or yep. whether you have a strip of land or whether you have a farm and that's important. Yeah, do you wanna talk, talk to me about this? Cause one of the things that I think I've quoted before, maybe people are, are familiar with this reference, 
But if you go back 100 to 120 years ago and you take a tomato, uh, you know, the nutrient density of a tomato now is like, I mean, there, there are studies showing it might be 25% or 30% of what it was. How much does the top soil have to do with that and actually what we're doing with that for the nutrient density of, a, of the food we're eating today? It has a lot to do with it. And tomato is obviously an annual plant. And yeah. while I believe perennials should be the base of a system, you can plant annuals, but you need perennials to be there in the system. But you're absolutely right. If there's no topsoil, it requires you to pick a plant before it's ripe because when the plant starts to ripen, there's a lot of infestation issues. Mm. Do you know that a healthy plant can repel insects? It can be resistant to microorganisms. So if you think about it, locusts, Grasshoppers can destroy crops. They pick and choose which crops to destroy. They destroy the weak ones. When you have a strong crop that is high in nutrients, plant nutrients, you're benefiting the humans that eat it and you're keeping pests away. And so one of the reasons our nutrient density is so low is that yes, the topsoil is depleted. We use synthetic fertilizers that produce just NPK, which is nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, or I did that yeah. backwards, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but we strip all these minor minerals like boron and manganese and mm. selenium and copper. So topsoil is one. Number two, because of our centralized food system, we have to pick everything unripe. I remember driving behind a big truckload of what I thought were limes in Florida, because citrus capital of America, but it turns out they were oranges. So we're not getting oranges picked when they're orange, they're being picked when they're green. If they're not organic, they're gas ripened. And so you don't get nutrient density when you yeah. pick the fruit before it's fully ripened. So there's so many issues. And then on top of it, you might be getting more harm than good from that fruit because there's pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, some crops like wheat are sprayed with glyphosate, which is essentially Roundup. So it's, it's, it's tough today, but if you have the privilege of consuming local food, of growing local food, it's pretty exciting. It's powerful, and our children have no idea where our ancestors came from. We were an agrarian nation, and that's been stolen from us, right out from under our noses. Yeah. Yeah, so this stuff is a big deal. As Jordan's talking about topsoil, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, again, one of the things that's being so effective is the food you're eating today the nutrients are greatly depleted because of the farming practices. A lot of the big agricultural companies today, and one of the things I know Jordan and I are both committed to, and I wanna say Jordan uh, is really pioneering in certain ways, is different ways to help regenerate the soil, different ways to help heal the planet, which in turn will help heal you. It'll make your food more nutrient dense. And one of the projects, Jordan, I know that you and I are both the co-founders of Ancient Nutrition. And we have a we have a project called the Ranch Project. I'd love for you to talk about some of the things that you and I are doing together in order to help heal the planet and help support people's health as well. Before I share that, I wanna share with you something that I heard. I did not come up with this, but it blew my mind just a few days ago. Another name for topsoil is humus. So man, which is the word Adam or Adam in Hebrew, man is who Adam was and Eve, both created in God's image. Human means a man that came from the dust of the earth. Wow. And when I heard that, I just couldn't believe it. Wow. So when someone says what's so important about topsoil, our connection to the earth is indelible. And the Bible says, you came from the dust of the earth, humus, and you will return, because we're organic matter, right? Yeah. I don't know if you remember from The Lion King where uh, Mufasa is having a discussion with Simba, and he, and he talks about you know, the antelope. Well, don't we eat the antelope? And he said, yes, Simba. But when the antelope dies, it becomes the grass. Or when we die, the lions, we become the grass, and the antelope eats the grass. But And he talks about the circle of life and then the music, which I'll spare you from. But <laughs> um, if you think about it, we are so connected. I really believe yeah. he, in humus, ultimately will form coal and fossil fuels. And so you think about it, it's all connected. Like our power and our food supply is all indelibly connected to the earth where we came from. But back to the ranch project. So ranch stands for regenerative agriculture, nutrition, and climate health. Now you and I have a lot in common. We're men of faith. And typically we are painted to be these conservative people who don't care about the environment, right? In other words, 
the left cares about the environment, the right does not. I can promise you that's not true in yeah. every case. I believe that our climate is suffering, our atmosphere is in worse shape because of conventional agriculture. That doesn't make me someone who's not a person of faith. It actually is logical. We need to breathe in oxygen. The more oxygen we have, the healthier we are. Carbon or carbon dioxide is sort of a um, antithesis of oxygen, right? We know trees respirate. They breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen. Yeah. We're the opposite. Yeah. So if you can hold more carbon in the soil, carbon becomes topsoil or humus, then the atmosphere contains more oxygen. And I can tell you a whole story about why lifespan shortened after the fall of man. We'll save that for another time. But what we're doing with our ranch project, we have a new headquarters we opened up called the Ancient Nutrition Center for Regenerative Agriculture and Sustainability, ANSAFRAS for short. We're trying, we're not blueberry farmers or pawpaw farmers. We are sun farmers. So we're harnessing the solar power. That's what plants are, these solar panels. Mm -hmm. And we are building topsoil. So if you say, what are you growing? We're growing topsoil. And every year we want to grow more topsoil. We want to harvest more water. And we want to provide more nutrient-dense plants that we can provide to people to transform their health. So imagine eating more food, healthier food, while the soil gets healthier at the same time. So we're, in a very real sense, reversing the curse. Because I can tell you, the curse of man in the Bible, part of it is annual agriculture, mm -hmm. conventional agriculture. And we're going to take 110 acres and transform it in front of the world. And that means it can be done anywhere in the poorest nations of the world to the wealthiest. In fact, I would argue the poorest nations have a greater chance than we do. So we're excited. It's something our team's going to play a role in. And best of all, when fast forward two years from now and you're consuming a superfood product from Ancient Nutrition, you will know exactly where that comes from. You're going to know where the seeds came from. And we'll have team members that can talk to a customer and say, I planted a tree that provided for the superfood you're using. So it's a virtuous cycle, if you will. I and mean, that's one of the things I think that, you know, it makes ancient nutrition so unique is the fact that we're using these ancient principles, these biblical principles, in order to create the world's most powerful superfoods and supplements. And so all that being said, I said, I, I know that this is something you and I are both so passionate about, but also think about just your food supply today. Think about what this can do for the world. If people start to follow these regenerative agriculture principles that you're following and pioneering out at the ranch, what, what's that going to do when we're talking about having double or triple or quadruple the amount of nutrients in a food today, what that's going to do for, you know, having, uh, you know, less carbon, more oxygen for our lifespan, or our health. I mean, this is really, really powerful, cutting edge stuff. And it's something that a lot of people don't know about, but it is so, so important as we're getting into all of this in terms of what we can do. One of the other things, Jordan and I were out at the ranch last week, and I loved walking through some of the greenhouses and seeing some of the amazing trees and herbs and plants. In fact, we had black turmeric growing. That was incredible. Talk about some of the unique superfoods that we're growing out there at the farm and some of the benefits of those. It's funny. We have decided, or man has decided to domesticate or hybridize certain plants. So I love berries. The raspberries have been highly improved. And I remember meeting with a high vice president at Driscoll Farms, which is the largest producer of organic and non-organic raspberries. And they're working on all of these scientific ways to make raspberries last longer, taste sweeter, look better. I'm rewinding and trying to find fruits that have not had that level of hybridization. So think about it. In the old days, the more sour or even bitter a fruit was, the more beneficial. Yeah. Things, you don't think about these things, but certain fruits are being bred to have either no seeds or the smallest seed possible. So a lot of what we're looking at, we planted 130 species of exotic and I would say uh, rare superfoods. And I looked for the opposite of what everyone looked for. So I love the uh, Anona, spe Anona family of fruits. So we're talking about something called soursop or graviola. That is the most powerful superfood you can imagine. Why don't we use it here? I don't know. It's tropical, grows in Florida, grows in South America, grows in Africa, but it's got a lot of seeds. It's not the taste that we're used to. It takes some getting used to, but the leaf, the fruit, the rind, 
has certain compounds that boost the brain and are anti-carcinogenic. We, another one, Jabota Kava. This is kind of along the lines of acai berry or blueberry. It's super high in antioxidants. It's the Brazilian grape. It grows on the bark of a tree. Wow. It has a thicker skin, bigger seeds, and way more antioxidants than anything we've seen. There's a cousin of Jabota Kava that we've all heard of, Camu Camu, mm -hmm. which is a rich source of vitamin C, and another cousin called a blue grape. And I tell you, I couldn't buy seeds. I bought the fruit from a farm in Miami and I was eating the fruit to spit out the seeds. This fruit, this, the peel is so bitter. It almost tastes like a combination of battery acid dipped in pickle juice. And, and I know it's, it sounds brutal, but yeah. do you know what's in there? I mean, we're talking about elagitannins, which actually cause cancer cells to, to self-destruct, wow. apoptosis. So those are just a few examples. We have a certain fig that has been called a sacred fig. The tree goes, grows to 100 feet tall, grown in Nepal and uh, Myanmar and other areas of the Middle East and India, et cetera, but it produces powerful fruit, leaves, et cetera. Pomegranates we love, guava is amazing, passion fruit. These are more common. Papaya is awesome. So the list goes on and on. I learn more about fruit than most people will ever care to know, but. I think we need to think outside the box. Blackberries are great, strawberries are great, blueberries are great, but anything that's been improved and hybridized, it comes at a cost. Yeah, I mean, I mean just think about the basic example of something like a tomato, right? You've got heirloom tomatoes and, and they're ugly looking or less, they're, they're not this perfect round, but again, the, the, there are things there I even, you know, and a lot of things are hybridized surprisingly, even bananas, certain things. I mean, really the smaller bananas, those, tend to be sort of the original bananas and so, but yeah, I mean, this is happening to a lot of foods. And so Jordan, what are some of the side, so, so you know, one of the things that's happening is, as Jordan mentioned, we have this addiction to sweet and salty in America and sweet really activates the pancreas, but we're over activating, over stressing our pancreas with too much sweet. And then sour really helps, sour and bitter really support our liver and our gut microbiome. And we're missing those flavors that's important for detoxification and cleansing and it's anti-cancer benefits. And so getting, you know, growing foods in their original form, they were meant to be grown, as I think Jordan is going back and helping regenerate, bring it back to Genesis the way it's supposed to be, is so powerful for the planet, but it's also so powerful for us in fighting disease and healing our bodies. Now, Jordan, one of the other things I know that I think is just you know so important to talk about is uh, you know looking at organic. Okay, what percentage do you think of in terms? Of, I don't know if you know this number, but in terms of farming today, what percentage of farms? And the food that we eat is 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 not organic. That's sprayed with pesticides and herbicides. Just a ballpark. Ninety-four to ninety-seven percent of the food we get, and particularly the U.S. agriculture, is not organic. So I think I've heard the highest level was six percent organic farmland versus ninety-four percent non-organic. Now we source a lot of our food from overseas because we want to get we want to have tropical fruits all year round, et cetera, or all over the world, Mexico, et cetera. But about 6% of American farms are organic. And here's the worst part. I think there's less each year, mm. not because the demand isn't there, but because we're bringing in more international imported organic foods and it's, it's hard to be organic. Small farmers are being driven out of their livelihood and their children and grandchildren are having to get other jobs because farming's become so hard. And what's the difference? Go through like what, what you know. What does it take to be certified organic in terms of just the basics there? And what what are the typical health differences if you've seen any sort of data in the past? Well, I'll start with the health differences. This is disputed because conventional foods they don't want you to know that organic can be better for you. But there are certain instances where organic can be fifty percent higher in a vitamin or a mineral. Wow! Because some of these pesticides and herbicides, for example, copper-based pesticides, compete with zinc levels and mm -hmm. copper in the plant. So you're gonna have lower nutrients just because of that. So you could have lower nutrients, higher level of toxicity, and many of these sort of pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides are banned in other countries. I mean, certainly glyphosate is in some of these yeah. genetically modified organisms, but you also have just a lasting set of issues when you're consuming things that 
have not ever been consumed before by humans. I mean, they're always trying to make bigger, better, faster, stronger pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, synthetic fertilizers, and they they pay we pay a price. I mean, you see that these are toxins listed on the Environmental Protection Agency's website. I mean, this is no joke. I mean, some, these pesticides arrive at your farm with a skull and crossbones on them. So when you're organic, first and foremost, if you had land that was not organic, you need to have three years of no pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, or synthetic fertilizers, even items. So think about if you have wood barns or poles, you can't have treated wood there. Mm. You can't have certain areas where you're dumping things that are not organic. So you get a third party certification, it takes three years. Now, if your land has never used pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and you have proof, you can be certified quicker, and that's amazing. So our farm at the Ancient Nutrition Center for Regenerative Agriculture and Sustainability has been using organic practices for a minimum of 20 years. In fact, wow. the previous owners, we have affidavits from them that they didn't use it either. Another rule, you can't have an organic farm within 30 yards of a non-organic farm. So when you have an organic farm, say that you're next to a conventional cornfield, you have to have a 30 foot buffer so that things don't blow your way. Mm -hmm. And that's really not enough. What we try to do, our farms in Tennessee and Missouri, we don't have any chemical uh, farming around us, but even silly things, when there were mosquito issues, they wanted to come and spray all the waterways with insecticides to get rid of the mosquitoes. And we had to go to the local city commission to ask to abstain from that. So I mean, it's, it's insidious. And then with animals, the animal medicines, which animals are over-medicated way more than humans, if you can believe yeah. that. Their waste goes into the waterways. Antibiotic residue goes in the milk. So we, you and I both have lectured and said, how many of you have had an antibiotic in the last week? And you know, 10% raised their hand, but how many of you had conventional dairy or meat? And yeah. then like a lot of people raised their hand because we're the reason our body doesn't fight these bugs is because we're taking low doses of antibiotics in our food and in our drinking water. Yeah. And it's, I don't wanna be a doomsdayer here, but either you're sort of going along the primrose path or you're part of the solution. And that's why for me, I have made great sacrifices to farm. It's not easy. I had opportunities to do other amazing things with the prosperity God blessed me with. And I chose to invest in a vehicle that can help others, which is a sometimes a, a thankless investment, if you know what I mean. But oh, yeah. it's all that really matters when push comes to shove. Yeah. Now all, all this stuff you're saying is a big deal. You know, we started talking or for a few minutes here just talking about the importance of organic and you saying, hey, it can have double the nutrients sometimes. We, we're, you know, it's obviously free of the chemicals, the pesticides, all these things. One of the other things, Jordan, I know that uh, you know, you've raised is some really incredible exotic animals. Okay. And so yaks water buffalo, and then of course, so, so, some things we're used to, like chickens and goat and sheep. Actually, I wanna go back to this point because you had said this. Well, what are some of the things that you have done or we have done at the ranch in order to keep our animals healthy? Um, because I know sometimes today, people are using certain types of, to a degree, like essential oils or herbs or other things to actually keep the, the animals healthy rather than using conventional antibiotics. Yeah, well, we have uh, a pretty exciting group of, I'll call it therapies that we use. First and foremost, when an animal gets sick, it's bad news. I mean, I'm sure you're a pet owner yep. and there's certain things when, an, when a horse or even a dog gets sick, you're, you're facing an uphill battle. I will tell you that livestock should be healthy almost all the time. And when they're not, it's really hard to get them better. That being said, we try to be preventative. So for detoxification, not because we have chemicals, but even certain grasses that have been planted like fescue can cause toxicity. So we ha always have a red mineral salt and clay available for our animals to eat. It's called free choice. So we have it in bins and they seem to know to eat it when they need it. Wow. So your book, Eat Dirt, yep. where pica, which is the eating of clay, the animals do that. So you, animals will eat more clay when they have more toxins in their body and it helps flush it out. We also have structured, energized water going throughout our farm and our ranch. So uh, whether it's crops or livestock, they're consuming 
healthier water where we lower the surface tension and all these cool things. But when it comes to medicine, so on our ranch in Missouri, the couple that runs it, they're both chiropractors and acupuncturists, and the wife of the husband-wife team is also a homeopath. And so we have a whole, I'll call it natural pharmacy, where we use everything from probiotics. I never even told you this, but we had some issues with some bottle-fed water buffalo where the moms were first-time moms, didn't know how to mother, and we were using our probiotic on our water buffalo because wow. they were having diarrhea, which is called scours in livestock. And that kills a lot of animals. And so we're having great results just putting our probiotics in the bottle. But we have all kinds of things. We use essential oils. We use certain minerals. And it's it's not easy, but over time, we're building an extremely healthy herd or herds. And part of it is bringing in livestock that are long-lived and not sort of hybridized either, right? I mean, we have, in America, been infatuated with Angus and Holstein cattle. Holstein's the, you know, the Chick-fil-A yeah. cow yeah. that produces milk. They're, someone once told me a Holstein cow is born trying to die. And that's why Holstein dairy cows live on average in a conventional environment less than two lactation periods. Now, they don't produce as much milk as the ridiculous standards demand, and so they're sold off into the meat market, right? But we're looking for animals that live 20, 25 years that don't need medicine. Yep. So just like humans, the best way to get healed is to never get sick. Our first goal is prevention, but ultimately we want the healthiest animals and plants possible because guess what? The defense system they built is transferred to the people when they consume the food. So it's, yeah. it's not difficult. It's actually very simple. We have made it difficult with our infatuation, as you mentioned, of perfectly round and red tomatoes and just needing everything to be a certain way. More sugar, less fiber, less nutrients. It's not the way to go. And so we're trying with difficulty to reverse that because agricultural changes don't come fast. Yeah. You need another year for a harvest. You need another three years for an animal to be born and then have an offspring. So this is not fast. It's And I, every day I feel like I'm just starting again. I mean, that's, yeah. we've seen some great successes and we have learned the hard way in many instances too. Yeah. You know, Jordan, I know one of the th current themes that keeps, he keeps coming up is going back to the way things used to be. When you're looking at the way uh, that farming should be done, you're going back looking at the Garden of Eden and early on in terms of what, you know, what, what God really has called us to do. When you're talking about, uh, when you were talking about animals, raising animals, I know you were even looking back, going at the DNA and looking at Okay, what type of cattle was the original cattle, and uh, you know, you know that hasn't really changed much over time. Everything from zebu to was now yaks and water buffalo, and raising those. I think that's so important is going back to these ancient ways uh, that, that were done early on, and obviously going and versus the rest of the world. It seems like that how can we continue to change things more and more versus go back to getting certain things in our diet and, and helping you know, regenerate the planet in certain ways. So all that being said, one of the most ancient forms of uh, transforming a food or keeping a food around longer is fermentation, right? So we know fermentation has been done for a long time. You have uh, formulated some of the world's most powerful supplements. I tell people this constantly, but Jordan, I think you're known in the space, and you would never say this about yourself, but you're known as being the most innovative and I think most uh, powerful formulator of supplements on the planet. With that, one of the things that you use, tools you use to help transform a supplement is fermentation. Talk to me about uh, fermentation, what it is, and how you use that in the supplements that you create. I describe fermentation pretty easily in that you remove the bad from a substance and multiply the good. I mean, if you think, think about your bank account, you remove the debt and multiply your investments. That's yeah. what fermentation does. So you take cabbage, good. Sauerkraut, which is fermented cabbage, amazing. Milk, some can be good. Fermented dairy, kefir, much better. The list goes on and on. So fermentation unlocks the good in something and it can reduce the bad. So we ferment a lot of plant material that contains naturally occurring compounds like cyanide. People don't realize this, but grapes contain cyanide. Peaches contain cyanide. When you ferment those fruits or the seeds or the leaves, you end up 
converting those cyanides into compounds that can actually destroy bad things in your body. So that's really, really powerful. Before I came here, one of my sons, Samuel, has the sniffles today. I don't know if he, he is an adopted child of ours, came with terrible eczema and will have seasonal allergies occasionally. So I don't know if it's an allergy here in Tennessee or if it's a cold, but before we left, we just recently at our farm made, we call it fermented fire tonic. So it was a combination of garlic, horseradish, cayenne, ginger, and turmeric, wow. warming herbs. And we fermented it for seven days with apple cider vinegar. And he and I took four droppers, toasted and took a shot. I didn't need it because I don't have a cold, but I benefited from it, right? So the synergy of the bitter, pungent, warming roots and spices combined with that fermentation or aging, it's powerful. Garlic, for example, garlic is good, but there are hundreds of studies on fermented or aged garlic. Wow. We've talked about that before. Ginger is a great ferment, pickled ginger, for example. So uh, I consume fermented foods pretty much every day. Kimchi is another wonderful yeah. one, and various sauerkrauts. My grandmother, probably your grandmother, and everyone's grandmother oh, yeah. consumed fermented foods out of necessity. Even the breads were fermented. Now, Jordan, one of the things that happens when you ferment something, I've heard you talk about this at seminars when you're teaching people, but also new compounds are created that, that, that weren't there before. Absolutely, so take ginseng. We've talked about how amazing ginseng is. It's a five-star adaptogen. It's great to enhance energy and warms you up and gives you more vigor. Ginseng contains ginsenicides. I'm gonna be technical here, and they're good. But when you ferment ginseng, the fermentation creates something called ginsenicide, glycosides, combining the ginseng with sugars that sort of escort these compounds into your body. So ginsenicide glycosides, fermented ginger, excuse me, ginseng, is more absorbent in a topical, so it penetrates your skin quicker, and it's more immunologically active. So fermented ginseng, contains a compound that's not in regular ginseng that your body can benefit from. So another way to consider fermentation is pre-digestion, pre-assimilation, I can call it activation. So anything that you consume fermented makes it easier on your body to digest and often provides probiotics and enzymes as a side benefit. I love it. So as Jordan's talking about fermentation is so powerful, a couple big things here. One, more absorbable, and number two, new compounds that weren't there before and that can impact your body in such a powerful way, whether it's turmeric or ginseng or ginger, fermented herbals and fermented foods are so powerful for us. Jordan, I wanna close with this. I wanna ask you about one of our mission statements at Ancient Nutrition, and that, and that is to save the world with superfoods. Talk to me about how superfoods can help save the planet and save people. Absolutely, we talked about creating a perennial farm, or we call it a perennial food forest. That's what Adam and Eve lived in. A perennial food forest is comprised of what we would call fruits, nuts, and certain vegetation. You plant it once, and this blows my mind, you plant a walnut tree and your great-grandchildren eat walnuts from the tree one time. So what we're doing is we are planting a system that is anchored with perennials, one million perennials that are superfood bearing. They create higher quality superfoods. We're using sort of, I'll call it ancient varieties. I don't want the improved, beautiful. I don't need beautiful. We're putting it in a supplement, right? Yeah. So our superfoods are gonna be higher in phytonutrients. And because they're perennials, they're going to build topsoil. They're going to capture more sunlight through photosynthesis, capture more carbon. So every year, more people are gonna benefit from the higher quality superfoods, and they're going to see, as we show the world, our soil, our topsoil is growing. Moringa is a plant that is talked about a lot as a superfood. We're growing Moringa indoors, and this is so cool. We're putting nutrients into these, we call them grow pots, but they're really soft cloth to allow the roots to properly grow. And But the nutrients we put in the Moringa plants seep into the soil and create healthier soil underneath wow. and for the plants that are surrounding it. So everything we do is intentional. I told you we're gonna be planting watercress in the waterways. We're gonna be planting wheat 
rye and oat grass in the alleys. And then all the perennials that we have, instead of fertilizing with chemicals, we're planting clover and plantain right in the tree rows to capture and put nitrogen into the soil. And it's all edible. So our superfoods are gonna transform people's health and by growing them, we're transforming the soil. So this is a do good project all around. I know for me, if I had to choose, I'm gonna buy this product that helps the planet and is better for me versus this product that doesn't help the planet and isn't as good for me, it's an easy choice. And so we feel like those who support ancient nutrition are supporting transformation for our bodies and our planets, our planet and superfoods are fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, herbs and spices that contain a greater amount of benefit than the average ordinary food. So when I talk about growing acai and pomegranate and jabota kaba and sacred fig and papaya and soursop, these are superfoods. You can't get those nutrients yep. from your regular apple. Even the apples we grow are, we grow Siberian crab apple, which is higher in a compound called fluoridzine, which is in the apple skin that helps blood sugar. So wow. the list goes on and on. So you can consume superfoods, save your health and the planet at the same time. That's where saving the world with superfoods comes from. It's a double blessing whenever you consume our products. I love it. Well, I want to encourage you guys, check out, as Jordan talked about, Jordan is the co-founder, along with myself, of Ancient Nutrition. You guys can check it out there. And also, just want to encourage you guys, we talked about a lot today, certified organic. It, it, do your best to get more organic foods in your diet on a daily basis. Do more to support different businesses that do regenerative agriculture. That's going to be good for our planet and your kids in the future and really for everyone. So really think about that. We just want to encourage you to be on that mission with us to help save the world with superfoods. And again, I want to thank uh, Jordan Rubin uh, for coming on today. And you can learn more about Jordan. Just You can search online Jordan Rubin supplements, Jordan Rubin book like the Maker's Diet. Learn more about him online as well. I want to say thanks everybody for listening. Thanks Jordan for coming on. We'll be back again next week with another show. Thank you. And we encourage you again to save the world with superfoods. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed in this podcast are not medical advice and have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. In some cases, individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to herein.